thank you very much for having me here today. I have to thank Professor Kahn and the organizing committee for this wonderful meeting. I'm, go I'm going to give you um, very briefly an overview about the anatomopathological features, radiological and physiopathological features of uh, pediatric brain trauma in comparison to adult brain trauma. Most of the things have already been very well explained by the other speakers. What about the age? We have uh, two main points about the age. Kids uh, between three and seven years of age and uh, adults and young adults, adolescents, and of course, uh, uh, older people. Especially, I have to tell immediately this uh, in Europe, because we have an aging population, we have birth rate that is uh, getting lower year after year. And I was very impressed about the percentage of uh, kids trauma in your country. Of course, in the literature, are well recognized the false as a major cause of brain trauma in kids, followed by motor vehicle related accidents and strikes on blows directed to the head. The demographic profiles, boys behave uh, in a certain way uh, badly compared to girls, and this is a normal experience also in our uh, houses. And what is interesting, at least in Europe, in occidental countries, there is also a certain degree of uh, a higher number of uh, brain trauma in kids during the weekend due to the sport-related activities, rugby, uh, soccer, uh, basketball, and so on. Football, of course, in uh, uh, USA. What about the modality of trauma? Re literature recognizes uh, very well the point that uh, closed trauma is the main factor in kids and the acceleration deceleration is the main mechanism of trauma. So the head is shaken in a certain way due to the fact that the head body ratio is higher in kids compared to adults. They have big heads, small bodies, and of course the neck is very small and the osteoligamentous capabilities to maintain the system and construct, the natural construct is weakened. So there is a higher torque movement at the level of the head. The radiological excursus, epidural hematoma. Of course, uh, epidural hematoma is the main, uh, at least uh, scholastically and orthodoxically, the main uh, event that we have to face. This is uh, uh, the reason, uh, is an anatomical reason, the inner uh, table of the skull, at least until the valley of 1516, is very attached to the dura. So there is not, uh, uh, there is not, uh, um, there is a sort of virtual space, but what is interesting in kids, like in this guy, he, this is a 60 year old boy fallen from the bike. They have also venous epidural hematomas that is very free, frequent available of the spine, but mostly also available of the uh, anterior cranial base due to the orbit fractures. This is not arterial, but venous hematomas. That means that they can develop over days and not over hours, and they are very liquid. So it's a, we are able to take it out just with a sm small bar hole like a chronic subdural hematoma in uh, ancient uh, people. Acute subdural hematoma is another uh, evidence. It's a devastating, usually it's associated with brainstem uh, injuries, of course. Ping pong fracture, not unfrequent, very uh, fancy to be uh, operated. The point is, uh, if uh, surgery is required in these kids, uh, if you have a fracture like this, obviously you have to take it uh, out, you have to relieve the fracture. But it's very debated if in pediatric neurosurgery, if we have to operate on a tiny ping pong fracture, because uh, it's a common experience that they reduced over days spontaneously. And in the second point, there is no evidence that an unrelated <coughs> and relief fracture will bring to uh, epilepsy, even if there is some uh, reports in the literature. So actually my point is not to operate them unless they're not very uh, well uh, established. Of course, shaken baby syndrome, this is a, a horrible social situation. We have uh, clinical uh, evidence, of course, on the bodies, on the eyes, but what about the brain? We have chronic sudural hematomas and uh, we have indirect signs of uh, a, a suffering uh, of shaken baby syndrome in the occipital uh, poles where you have uh, gliotic scars uh, after months. This is a secondary sign. This is a rare case of a shaken baby syndrome who received them with a large, sorry, it's not working, with a large, acute, subtemporal, 
hematoma and this was operated on, this is related to a fact that the venous system at the level of the temporal pole is uh, very fragile and it can be touched like uh, closer to the sagittal sinus. What about cerebral contusions? In toddlers and infants are very rare. And it was pointed out by the previous speaker, I, I was looking at the typology of the lesions are very rare in kids due to different reasons. First of all, because usually in adults they are produced by the asperities of the skull base and in kids there are no asperities. So this is the normal radiological and anatomo-radiological aspect of a uh, contusion. And the fact that probably are very, very uh, rare in kids is related to the fact that there are skull-based asperities. There is a less peristeribal CSF space, so the brain cannot move as in young adults and in adults. And there is a different myelinization. This is also demonstrated by animal models. This is a very um, a couple of two uh, nice uh, papers. These are translational models of a brain damage. And uh, uh, they demonstrated that with the same force uh, in different uh, moments uh, on the rats, uh, you can obtain different kinds of contusions, probably due to myelinization. That means that young adults and adults uh, are more prone to develop contusions instead of kids that are more prone to, to develop a diffuse brain damage or very, light, uh, very tiny focal contusions. This is another uh, case, very particular. Uh, I was involved, I was on call. This is a six-year-old boy. This was a pedestrian car accident. This is a gypsy kid. And uh, it was not clear if at the time of the trauma, he was just uh, in the street or he felt and then a car uh, was on him. And if you see the picture, it's strange because at the, at the time I, I was suspecting an EVM rupture. So I did... Uh, an angel CT scan and in 20 minutes the hematoma was growing. You see at, at the active spotting of bleedings, but actually even if it was just an angel CT, I didn't see any kind of anomaly, a vascular anomaly. And so I went to the OR, I took it out. I didn't find any kind of uh, a vascular problem. And uh, then I looked uh, to the literature and actually it's uh, well described in the pediatric population. These are deep seated basal ganglia para uh, caudatus nucleo uh, hematomas, and these are related to the sharing forces that are, uh, of course, the same mechanism of diffuse brain damage. In this case, there is a rupture of the perforating arteries at the level of M1 and C1, and they produce these big similar sh Charcot hemorrhages like in all the people, but these are traumatic hematoma. Of course, uh, we told uh, before that uh, the main mechanism are closed trauma, diffuse brain damage. And this is another case, very anecdotal from my point of view, about uh, all the paradigma of uh, pediatric brain trauma. They are different from us, at least until the age of 10, 12. This is a seven-year-old girl, pedestrian car accident, this is eight, at the, at the first uh, uh, entering in the ER. She was isochoric. We, uh, as you can see, the CT scan just shows uh, us SAH, nothing special, small ventricles, but not so much in relation to the uh, head. Maybe with a sign in front of the brain stem, a little bit of blood suggesting an important dynamic for the, for the trauma. The ECP was between 12 and 15 for the first 24 hours. And then we observe a progressive ECP uh, increase over to 30, requiring osmotic therapy. So we repeat, of course, a CT scan. And the CT scan was incredibly normal. You see cisterns with small contusion and the air probably at the site of insertion of the ECP uh, probe. Uh, the point that we will, were not trusting ECP, so we changed the ECP. Maybe it's broken. And the ECP was correct. It gave the same values, so high values. So the point what to do now, osmotic, hypothermia, hyperventilation, uh, probably the mechanism is a sort of loss of autoregulation between CPP and ICP. It is very frequent in kids because what is happening, the uh, PRX line that is normal in this way, in kids frequently goes in this way. So there is a loss of autoregulation due to the diffuse brain drama. And so we went to bifrontal decompression controlling the ICP. That is probably a very aggressive uh, 
attitude, but uh, we obtain a, a result. Just to say that kids, from a pathophysiological point of view, are completely different. You cannot expect what's going on with this uh, nice paper from the South African group. This is one of the patients they had. You see increased ICP, normal extraction on PTO2. You have a, a MAP that is growing, is not normal. Flat here, then a decrease in MAP, decrease in oxygen obstruction, and increase in ICP. So there is a, a great variability among kids and inside the same kid, uh, respectively, from the therapies that he's receiving during the course of the therapy. And for this reason, probably we need a multimodality, uh, if possible, monitoring this kid. So to finish, there are peculiar anatomopathologic and radiological scenarios. There is no absolute correlation between ICP and neuroimaging, at least not always. Frequent loss of cerebrovascular autoregulation, and this is a very confounding problem inside the same kid during the same period. In case of loss of autoregulation, there is extreme variability of the pressure reactivity index, and probably there is the need for multimodality monitoring. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was very nice and comprehensive uh, presentation. Any questions from the audience? Thank you very much, Dr. Gizan. It was a very nice, uh, comprehensive overview. Just curious, how do you think about this shaken baby syndrome or the child abuse? If it's, you know, we always had the difference, the difficulties in um, differentiating between child abuse and external uh, hydrocephalus, whatever that is, you know, because you put a lot of blame on the parents and things like that. So what, what's your experience and how do you actually evaluate these kids for child abuse in Italy? So it's working from, um, I, if I understand you are asking me how we manage the extra dura collections, the extra cerebral collection in these kids, correct? Yeah, and how you differentiate between what is child abuse and what is not. Difference between child abuse and what's more of a benign non-abuse. Okay, um, so, uh, non this is a <laughs> difficult question, I know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, of course, uh, the rest of the exams, uh, all the uh, X-rays body scan, okay, other signs of abuse, we always in this case, we keep the kid in the hospital and we let the family speak with a dedicated psychologist. I know that is not uh, something that can unmask a child abuse, but uh, we can, it can help it. And in some cases, I can tell you that we uh, asked for, uh, um, we, we do like this in our hospital for the police to put cameras in the room, in the private room. We, uh, find excuses to keep the kid for days and then we watch the family and in that way sometimes we found the stranger habits from a medical point of view it's just x-rays and then we attach the kid to a street follow-up from the clinical point of view uh, benign fluid extra cerebral collections in the pediatric age are very common in boys under the age of one and a half two years but they are not so thick like chronic sudural hematoma one uh, issue, for instance, is to use a transfontanellar Doppler to see the resistance of the diastolic wave on pericallosal. If you have an increase of the resistance, maybe there is an hypertension, and this is more related to chronic subdural hematomas that are not benign fluid extracerebral liquoral coll collections. Yes, Carlo. Uh, is it routinely uh, CT angiography in your center? Uh, angio CT, yeah, you mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. pediatric For, trauma. When, yeah, yeah, yeah. when we use it, you use there is a trauma protocol. Yeah, yeah, like in this case, if you have a trauma, we do. You have if you have a body, uh, um, head and body trauma, we do a, a head and body scan CT plus angio CT of the thorax and abdomen always. But in this case, I I uh, asked for angio CT because I was thinking for an AVM. So I was preparing myself for, to open an AVM, but it was not an AVM. Um, I have a, 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 state, a, a comment. You know, in the US, the incidence of non-accidental trauma is up to 20% in terms of pediatric admission for severe traumatic brain injury. Depends on your classification, et cetera. That was from Fred Rivara's study. 
So it's really quite common and it's very difficult, obviously, to diagnose. And I think the idea, as you said, there are some signs from the body imaging fractures of various uh, different ages, multiple yeah. fractures, retinal hemorrhages, yeah. the, the, the intracranial subdural hematomas, et cetera. I think it's all about suspicion. Yeah. And it's very difficult and very awkward to diagnose, but sending a child out with excellent care back into an abusive situation is a tragedy. Yeah. Um, but the question I have, particularly with the second speaker's excellent survey of adult and pediatric was there was an awful lot of hands that were negative. And I guess I was wondering if they were using any of the, the CT screening protocols, like in pediatrics, the PCARN the one that was published yeah. in the Lancet to determine who needs a CT scan. Mr. Benway, the second speaker. From the data we presented a comparison between the pediatric and adult, we also using similar, similar data because we had recorded multiple findings and multiple parameters. So we also conducted another study which was presented yesterday in which we tried to figure out some, uh, we found out that almost six, more than 60% patient, uh, patients had uh, grossly unremarkable or normal CT scan find. So that was a huge burden economically as well as the ionizing radiation. So we tried to conduct a study to uh, device institutional protocols for our institute that could be recommended for the uh, under as because we are an underdeveloped country we have a huge burden on two or three hospitals from a large uh, uh, population so uh, we can we don't have that facility to uh, admit or observe patients for more than eight hours 20, 12 hours so that was our escape but that is not rationalized as well so we conducted a study. We find out that uh, if the presence of uh, loss of consciousness for a few minutes, if the vomitings of one to four episodes, if the history of fits that was observed by any attendant or the medical professional was there, and uh, two, three more parameters, uh, the nasal bead or the uh, CSF rhinorrhea or CSF otorrhea, any such finding was found in a patient, then we should go for a CT scan. If one or more findings were there, uh, we also concluded that not a single uh, parameter can exclude or include the criteria for a CT scan. So we figured out ourselves that one or two must be present. And the loss of conscience and the vomiting, more than one episode, two, four episodes must be there. Uh, but still, we are modifying the data, uh, the study as well. But still, there is uh, this department needs to be, uh, this, like this particular department about the positive or CT, negative CT scan uh, needs. Uh, much further research. Thank you. Can I can I make one comment on the yeah. accidental traumas? You know, with the 2018 Dr. Chaudhary's uh, paper, like seminal paper that was endorsed by multiple societies, including radiographic radiological societies, the subdural hematomas. You know, of course, it's not you know easily available in most of the centers maybe but when you do an mri a mixed density subdural hematoma which is thick or a posterior fossa or intrahemispheric subdural hematoma are more suggestive of non-accidental traumas in addition to other clinical findings like you were saying um one thing for the ct is the canadian consortium has like the ct guidelines that we always use in us us and dr chestnut i'm sure is aware of that, like, you know, how or which patients that you need to use the CAT scan for in pediatric population, given the hazards of using the CT unnecessarily. So you're within the, you know, realm of using the CT in terms of, you know, patients who have loss of consciousness, who has like, you know, episodes of vomiting or seizures or neurological changes, of course, yes, afrenoria. So... I could just have a comment on that as well. We also have a Scandinavian guidelines for pediatric uh, mild and moderate TBI to decide which one do need a CT scan and which don't to, to try to reduce the numbers of sort of unnecessary uh, CT scans. 
and there also ongoing biomarker studies to see if uh, biomarkers could help us decide which kid would need um, a CD scan or not. But uh, you could check into the Scandinavian guidelines, they're pretty good. Okay, thanks. Normally, uh, just a query from Dr. Saad. If a child has got a small extradural hematoma, baby is conscious, stable, what, after what time you repeat the CT scan of that patient? And what, what is the interval? A patient is having extradural hematoma, small, he's, yes. After how much time you tend to repeat the CT scan? So initially, So, hello. Four hours after the initial presentation, mm -hmm. and if then we follow the GCS. But we are, uh, we can't take risks because our observation in the ER department is not that uh, good. Because if you have to observe, just observe a patient, you need a dedicated either a neurosurgical uh, staff or uh, that observation, our staff at the emergency department is not that well trained. So we don't take risks. Uh, we, it's better to get a CT scan than to uh, miss out an injury. So we at least follow for four hours after presentation. If there is no significant increase in the size and we are satisfied with the GCS and the uh, other clinical parameters, then we wait and observe. And maybe we, uh, sometimes so it, we don't need to carry- It's the first CT scan. After the presentation. After yeah. the should it be less than four hours? Because we have seen patients uh, getting uh, their hematomas enlarged and they are getting drowsy, right? Because in infants, usually the extradural hematoma, they grow very fast as compared to subdural hematoma. So I think it should be less than four hours. Yes, Two uh, hours or three hours will be enough. Well, well, well I, I have just seen... just have to have comments from Professor Khalik Saab in... Duration of hematoma, just uh, if we have got a CT scan and uh, we have got small hematoma, patient is stable, infant, extradural hematoma, we got, we got a CT scan and then we want to have a repeat CT scan. When do you think that, uh, in your opinion, should be the ideal time? Hello. May I Uh, I think uh, you know me, um, I go on clinical grounds. Uh, first, uh, it's not usually easy to arrange a CT scan for a baby. And second, uh, that radiations, for example, if you do too frequent. And third, it increases the stress amongst the family. Whenever you do repeated CT scans, they say there must be something that they're looking for. So unless you know what you're looking for, I think my practice is that you closely monitor the baby. If the baby does not improve over a certain period of time, or if he deteriorates even by one score, that would be the only indication for a CT scan. Because I think I'm deadly against all the routine CT scans in a period of time, perhaps in all neurosurgical um, uh, cases even after, uh, and especially in, under my circumstances in Pakistan, where actually the patient has to pay from his pocket. So there are a number of factors, but the most important thing is your clinical judgment when you keep the patient in the ward. If the patient has any persistent vomiting for say 24 hours, I, mean, I don't have to go into that because all of you are expert in neurological assessment and any deterioration or persistence of the neurological status and lack of improvement would be an indication for a CT scan. Um, I hope I made my point. Thank you. Uh, hello, I am Dr. Kamran. My question is uh, from Mr. Carlo, uh, that in pediatric head injury case, if there is a subgalial hematoma, so what is your protocol, whether we should uh, drain it or we should leave it uh, for conservative resolution? Thank you. We leave it. We leave it. Big subgalial, we leave it because uh, at least it's a common experience. If you drain it in an infant, it will refill. And you, can, you can't do a compressive medication in an infant always. 
So we leave it and we check for uh, hemoglobin over time. Okay, thank you. And, uh, I have a question. We have time, very few people. <laughs> How many of you are just uh, practicing pediatric neurosurgery or both? How many pediatric neurosurgery, just pediatric? Can you, just pediatric? Yes, yes, most of us are general surgeons. Because I was astonished by the, by the numbers of the two uh, lectures before my lecture. And uh, I was studying before the demography of Pakistan. And uh, one third of your population is between the age of zero and 14. And another 20% is between uh, 15 and 25 years of age. That means that the 50% of the population are kids or young adults. And I was uh, recollecting uh, in my mind uh, a lecture of, I think, 15 years ago of Dr. Tisley about the future of neurosurgery. And he was telling us that the future is not vascular because it's uh, be taken by neuroradiologists, are not brain tumors because are taken by medications, drugs, radiosurgery, and so on. But the future is neurotrauma, functional, if you have the money to do it, but especially pediatric neurosurgery. And in this section, we are seeing that pediatric neurosurgery is prevalent in your country and trauma also. So we think we have to think about it, about prevention and how to cure these kids because we have to be adults and have to contribute to our social lives, paying taxes for the young and for our old people. That's the point. I come from a continent where people are aging. You are living in continents where people are growing. So maybe we have to learn a lot from you how to manage our very few cases of pediatric brain trauma. Thank you very much. Yeah. So, Professor Yeah, so I agree with you. Actually, I remember a comment from a professor who was visiting us from Canada, and um, he presented a case to us um, about meningomyelocele. And he said that this is the only meningomyelocele that I have operated over the last so, so many years during my lifetime, for example. And this had come just recently, and uh, I didn't know, so I had to ring someone and say, what is the most, and I went into the literature. And um, here we are, I think all, all of us who are here, um, actually on average, perhaps every neurosurgeon operates two meningomyelitis or a meningocele a week. Wow. So therefore, there is a big, big uh, thing. And the only thing that they have done is introduce folic acid. So I think I agree with you. I think uh, there is one pediatric uh, component that is perhaps prevalent if um, we take necessary steps. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for highlighting it. Just, just going back to the uh, previous question of repeating the CT scans, um, I would definitely absolutely tend to agree with uh, Professor Khalid that they should only be done and judged on clinical grounds. But one thing I would like to add is that surprisingly, in my practice, what I have seen, and you might have also come across it, that those patients, pediatric patients, with minimal volumes of uh, extradural hematomas, subdural hematomas, which we are observing and waiting, they might expand, majority of them, they tend to resolve. You get a CT scan done after an interval of, say, 6, 12 hours, just out of curiosity, and you would see and you would find a scan as if nothing has been there. So please avoid scans, repeated scans. Obviously, one is the concern of radiation being given to children, and the other is they tend to resolve. Somehow, their dynamics are completely different from the adults. Thanks, sir, for such a nice presentation on pediatric trauma. I would like to share my opinion re regarding the subgalial collection or subgalial hematoma. Most of the time, it is subperiosteal extending from one to the other suture. What I do personally, I wait for one week. If within one week it resolves, it's okay. Most 80% resolve. 
but the 20% or 15% which remain, it get infected in spite of medication and antibiotic. So I sprayed that and, and it has got very good result with aspiration because once it get infected, it cause bone erosions and it can give rise to brain abscess as well. So uh, I do like that. Make a one comment um, because Professor actually mentioned the spina bifida. We've been talking about global neurosurgery. I think global neurosurgery for pediatric neurosurgery should be like prevention of spina bifida. That is, I think, one of the most important points. We never talk about prevention and especially pediatric population. About 50% of the you know, world's population will be children in 2050 and will be in Sub-Saharan Africa in South Asia. Uh, only about 78 of the countries have folic acid fortification that they add folic acid to, you know, common, you know, uh, goods that common like resources of food. You know, we still have to work on it. That would be one thing that global, you know, uh, neurosurgeons can actually look at and work on. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, gentlemen. It was a nice discussion. See you in the next session.